people have heard endless discussions about which diet is good and which foods are awful. And we're not going to do any preaching about any specific foods because people, I think, are tired of hearing that. But what I want to talk to you about is how do we decide among this morass of information about what you should and what you shouldn't? Like, how do we possibly decide? But first, um, a lot of your work has focused on eliminating junk food. And again, we've all heard that speech endlessly, but just for the listener who may possibly still have junk food in their world, um, which I, I don't actually. So for me, it's not even something I wanna hear more about, but um, let's hear what you would say to that person who still eats junk food. Well, I would say gently at first that we all have some <laughs> tolerance for it. There's kind of a threshold where you can eat freely to some degree and not have to worry too much about it, especially if you're physically active. But if you really want to optimize your body and your brain, it's important to notice that the the inputs, the, the fuel that we use um, is either ideal and, and optimal or it's dragging us down and causing our behavior, our health, our performance to degrade. And the way that you can know if something is, is working for you is really going to be kind of an individual decision. Everyone is a little bit different. And thankfully, we're seeing that uh, technology and the conversation has caught up to that to, to some degree, where it used to be that people would just kind of say, you have to eat this way dogmatically. You have to stay away from these foods. And as that conversation has evolved and kind of uh, a lot of people have run away with that discussion on the modern internet that rewards extremism. It means don't eat any meat. You're going to be saved if you go 100% vegan forever or don't eat any plants. They're toxic and they'll kill you. You have to go carnivore forever. And that's the answer. Of course, there's room for nuance and the answer is mostly in between. So okay. when it comes to so process, processed food, um, which is now called ultra processed food. We used to just call it junk food, right? I think that actually ultra processed food is a bit of a euphemism. Yeah. And we feel a little bit more comfortable eating something that's ultra processed because it almost makes it sound subconsciously like it's better. It's ultra, right? When in fact, our bodies just aren't well designed to eat that sort of thing and, and metabolize it and use it for energy. So you can so really see this applied in the animal world where um, some people who are, are dog owners or pet owners might be familiar with how to feed your animals real food as if they were in the wild. So for, for a dog, for example, that means instead of kibble, feeding them mostly meat, maybe some veggies in there, maybe some oats uh, and that sort of thing. Although it's debatable whether or not dogs should really be eating grains or humans should mm -hmm. be either. There are certain things that are more on the ideal side and others that are um, a little more questionable. But for the most part, if you're sticking to eating real food with few ingredients, whole ingredients, ingredients that you can pronounce if you're looking uh, at the box and it's got a bunch of different ingredients on it that are difficult to parse or full of numbers or chemicals, then that's a pretty good sign that it's not going to be ideal for your own body. Now, so um, I want to say something to parents. So when my kid was in middle school, I was one of the parents who volunteered to be selling food at lunchtime behind the counter. So the kid tells you what they want, you take their money and you give it to them. So we would have kids that would come up and say, uh, three cookies, two chocolate milks and a bag of chips. And so I was like, well, I really wanted to give them a lecture, but then part of me thought, well, maybe they're sharing that with five other people. I don't know, but I had a feeling that they were spending all of their lunch money on junk food. So just give us a very, very short, like one sentence, because you know how little um, uh, bandwidth they would have for this. So what would you tell them in one sentence? Because I feel very guilty that I didn't say much. Do you want to feel good now or do you want to feel good later? Because Okay, awesome. that's great. That's great. Good, good. Very perfect. Now, um, how did you get started being the fat burning man? <laughs> yeah, so um, 
it really started as a goof. It's a, it's a silly name. And I had been a lifelong uh, musician and a few other careers. But since I already had the equipment, um, it made it pretty easy to be one of the early podcasters. So I started back in 2011, 2012, and already had the microphone and, and the recording equipment. So I figured instead of just writing in the blogosphere, which I had been doing uh, for a few years previous to that, um, interviewing people became the main focus of, of my work and has continued to be the main focus of my work uh, in, in the years since then. And for me, my own kind of experience was that I always wanted to be healthy and I was trying to do that as much as I could through diet and exercise. And I've been a lifelong runner. I was getting really into running races back then, especially marathons and a few shorter distances. And I realized that a lot of the marathon runners, especially as they approached uh, middle aged, were carrying a spare tire, a lot of extra weight. And that just didn't really make a whole a lot of marathon sense. runner. Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah. It's it's quite amazing. Now, at the elite level, definitely not. You need to be quite skinny and not even have that much muscle on you. But for the people who were a little bit lower than that on the uh, in, in the realm of athleticism or performance, yeah, it seemed like a lot of people were trying to outrun the weight gain that had been going on for many years. And that might, may have been the reason that they even got into it. But the fact that they were carb loading and using a lot of sugar and trying to exercise more and eat less following their doctor's advice or the advice in the running magazines and the websites, it seems like it really wasn't working that well for a lot of people. And, and for me, doing that in my early 20s, um, I tried to follow that advice so well that it made me fatter and sicker than all my friends um, because I was doing it so much harder than they were back because then. you thought that the carbs were going to build your muscles is that it or build your endurance well yes building endurance, endurance um, and, and there's some element of truth to that but the real answer is that if you're staying away from fat and dietary cholesterol which is what i was doing then you really have to eat a lot more carbs or protein and for most people that means carbs so if you're kicking out the fats that means that for the most part, you're bumping up the grains or even the sugars or sometimes the processed foods and seeing that work in reverse for most people, um, seeing that they got sicker, fatter. Uh, for me, my thyroid started struggling because I was eating non-ideal foods. I was drinking a lot of orange juice, eating a lot of grains, um, and I felt hungry all the time. And I started oh. to get brain fog. And putting on 20 or 30 pounds in my early 20s, I felt like I was middle aged and, and my performance was not getting better, despite the fact that I was running a lot and I was trying to follow the diet to a T. But then um, I can I just tell you when when I was um, I, I have such a deja vu you're giving me uh, when you mentioned orange juice, mm -hmm. uh, because, yeah, we grow up. I grew up with the idea that it's healthy. Not to mention, I grew up with the con orange juice concentrate, not even fresh squeezed. I remember, but yeah. then I remember I was at a friend's house who was very health conscious, and he had a jug of carrot juice in his fridge. And he took it out and he said, this carrot juice is evil. It's terrible for you. And I was quite surprised because carrot seems healthier than orange and um, fresh pressed seems healthier than concentrate. But then I learned that when it's removed from the fiber, then it just gives you a surge of insulin. And does, I, it took me a while to learn that, but that fiber is what we really need to make foods natural. And I was like, wow, how, how come I had to reach this age before I knew that? Right, well, because it's been obfuscated. It's, there's not a whole lot of money in selling whole oranges or whole broccoli. Or whole, whole carrots, yeah. But yeah, well, that's the thing then carrots is evil. People say, oh, carrots have too much sugar. They're evil. You can't eat them. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask you, so with all of these like hyper responses to all different foods, so how do you decide for yourself? Like, do you eat carrots? How do you decide? Yeah, well, I do personally eat carrots and I love a good carrot here and there, but there is no perfect food if you're eating nothing but carrots or nothing but potatoes and i've in interviewed a few people who've had some wacky diets over the years on my podcast one of them in particular ate only potatoes for a year and he lost a lot of weight he 
optimized a lot of biomarkers by doing just that. Is it sustainable? No, not really. Is Do you it really mean problem? only potatoes with nothing on them? He would sometimes, I think, use a little bit of mustard or ketchup, you know, some condiments, but no other foods. And that doesn't sound great to me, you know. And then, of course, I've, I've had carnivores on the show who have just done nothing but meat and water for a few years. It seems like they're getting great results, too, at least short term. But I would argue that the reason that a lot of these extreme diets get at least on the surface, great results is because of not what they're eating, but what they're not eating. So if you go 100% raw vegan, that means that you're not eating pop tarts, you're not eating cereal for the most part, and all of these other processed foods. Same thing on the carnivore side where you can't be going out and eating a bunch of pizza if you say that you're a carnivore. Some do anyways or whatever. That's a whole separate dis discussion, you know, kind of attaching identity to how you're eating can be problematic for a lot of people. And also, I would argue that the best way or the healthiest way to be carnivore is to eat plants sometimes. And the healthiest way to be vegan is to eat meats sometimes. And we don't have to chastise each other or chastise ourselves for making that decision when it seems appropriate. And it's interesting because I was uh, I had Tony Horton on the podcast who created P90X and has just been a big guy in the, in the fitness field for a long time. And he says that he's 90% vegan, which I love. He's had some health um, struggles over the years and is dealing with health conditions. And so that seems like it works well for him. But if you tell most vegans that you're 90% vegan, that's not going to fly. You need It's all or nothing. And that's what comes from kind of identity-based behavior. Yeah. So, you know, I discovered a, there's a word for this, and I totally agree with you that building your identity around your food choices and then finding fault with other people's food choices, it's a very mammalian behavior. So I discovered the word orthorexia. Uh -huh. So <laughs> it's like anorexia, but in ortho means change. So it's like you're obsessed with making changes in your diet. And to the point of addiction. And then, of course, a big part of that is imposing those changes on others, because in my work, I always talk about how mammals want the one up position. And so when you impose your dietary restrictions on others or when you think that you're superior to the diet choices of others, then you feel one up. And that's really what people are looking for. But they will never admit it. Right. 